everybody, this video is a follow up to an earlier video I did looking at my 2017 Bolt EV Premier and why my husband and I chose to pursue a buyback offer from Chevrolet due to the LG Energy battery fires issue. If you've not seen that video, there's a link in the description below. When that video came out, we were still waiting to get an offer from Chevy and frankly, weren't sure what we were going to decide when that offer came in. Well, Chevy finally got back to us with an offer and after looking at our options, we've made a decision. So let's talk about what we considered, what the offer was, and what we eventually decided. First, a bit of a recap. We bought my 2017 Bolt EV from Vroom close to a year ago with 35,000 miles on the odometer for just about $19,000, having traded my beloved but terribly unreliable BMW i3 Rex when its warranty was up. Our household transportation fleet consists of my Bolt, my husband's Tesla Model 3 long range rear wheel drive, which I just did a video on that you can find here, a couple of electrically assisted bicycles, and usually a motorcycle or two. Those are petrol powered for now, but we'll be moving to at least one used electric motorcycle soon. So knowing that we were going to be receiving a buyback offer, and figuring it would be for around what we paid for the car, I spent a lot of time considering what I might do instead of a Bolt without laying out much if any additional funds. That means looking at the used EV market, and folks, it's honestly a bit of a bleak place under 20,000 US dollars, at least if you're looking for the kind of capabilities found in the Bolt and other long range EVs. To recap, the 2017 Bolt EV had a nominal 238 miles of range, 55 kilowatt CCS DC fast charging, 200 horsepower, 150 kilowatts, 266 foot pounds, 360 newton meters of torque, seating for four adults, 70 cubic feet, 478 liters of cargo space, and an upright riding position that led to GM describing it rather absurdly as a crossover. By the standards of modern EVs for sale new today, those specs are pretty middle of the road, though it's worth noting that the Bolt gained a bit more range in later models. But by the standards of electric cars under $20,000, those specs are frankly aces. So what are some of the options worth talking about? It's a conversation we've had quite a bit here at the channel as Kate Walton Elliott looks to get out of her family's 2015 i3 Rex and I look at possible alternatives to my Bolt if I was to accept a buyback offer. This video focuses on cars available at or under the $20,000 price point with clean titles, as opposed to salvage cars. As the person who moderates most of our comments, I can already hear you saying, that's unreasonably cheap, this whole exercise is absurd. So let me remind you that to a huge portion of the population, spending $20,000 on a car is still a staggeringly large amount of money. You can buy an excellent used internal combustion car with relatively low mileage and good fuel economy for significantly less money. My last piston car was a Mazda 3 with the Skyactiv engine. You can buy a loaded late model one of those with 50,000 miles on the clock for several thousand dollars less than 20k. Prices are even better on a Hyundai Elantra or a Toyota Corolla, often with far less mileage. I also don't talk here about any plug-in hybrids. They're great options for some people, and we briefly discussed having a Chevy Volt with a V again, but made the choice that we wanted to stay with battery electric vehicles instead. Side note, while I'm not going to be discussing the Volt with a V here, our PA and animator here at the channel, Erin, does own one that she purchased used last year. She made a really great video on her buying and early ownership experiences that you can see here. Oh, and if you're watching this on a device where YouTube cards don't work, don't worry, we'll leave links in the description too. With one exception we'll get to, I'm not taking any incentives into consideration in this piece, as incentives for used EVs vary from state to state and country to country. There are a few new EVs in the US that come in around our budget, even with incentives, though we'll get to that later. But keep in mind that in order to take advantage of federal tax incentives for EVs, the buyer has to have a large enough tax liability for it to matter, and you still have to pay the full purchase price at time of sale, though some states have instant rebates as well. Of course, as any of the accountants I've had over the years would tell you, I am not a tax expert, and you don't want to make financial decisions based on things I say about the subject. Consult a tax or financial advice professional, ideally one who had a better score on the math portion of the SAT than my sad figures. The reality is that people choosing to go electric on a budget are automatically going to be making sacrifices. Many of us would say that what we lose in features and comfort and convenience is made up for in cost of ownership, driving pleasure, and lessening our carbon footprint. But that doesn't mean those sacrifices aren't real. Moving on, first things first. A Bolt built after the battery pack defect was addressed is virtually impossible to find under $20,000. Once in a blue moon, a really high mileage 2019 Bolt that got lucky and received the new pack 
or 2020 will make an appearance, but it's rare and requires choosing a really high mileage vehicle which isn't for everyone. Likewise, on extremely rare occasions, a very early Tesla Model S with huge miles on the odometer, often in excess of 150,000, will pop up for sale under our price cap. But those early cars often have less range even than a Bolt and have their own issues. Buying an older luxury car is always a bit of a crapshoot, and fixing an older Tesla when problems crop up is not a headache a ton of owners are eager to embrace. I've yet to see any Model 3s with clean titles for sale under about $30,000, but I'm sure they come up from time to time too. Then there's the BMW i3, a car I absolutely love. Your, or my as the case may be, $20,000 will get you into a 2018 BMW i3 or i3 Rex, that's the model with the small petrol range extender, with the 94 amp hour battery pack, which I recall is about 33 kilowatt hours. That gets you much better range than Cater I got out of our earlier models. CCS fast charging is standard in the later i3s with a maximum charge rate of around 50 kilowatts and a nominal range of between 97 and 114 miles on battery power, depending on if you're hauling around a range extender or not. I'll be honest, this was a very tempting option to me. I've never loved a car like I love Tali, my 2014 i3 Rex, and even with her paltry 70 miles of range, I rarely use the range extender. But the i3 is an incredibly expensive car to repair and to ensure, thanks to the BMW rundle on the front and the carbon fiber body. Ours was a reliability nightmare, and Kate's experience hasn't been much different. Later models, such as the 2018, are supposed to have improved in the reliability department, but once burned twice shy, my husband quickly put the kibosh on any consideration of an i3. Next up is the venerable Nissan Leaf in several possible forms. The second generation LEAF received an overhauled battery pack with better range and supposedly a massively improved battery cell chemistry over the first generation, a car that heralded the mass market EV revolution but was so prone to battery degradation that we find ourselves constantly trying to explain that huge range losses over time isn't the norm for electric vehicles, though it is for a Gen 1 LEAF. The second generation LEAF, which entered onto the market as a 2018 model year car with its 40 kilowatt hour battery pack and 150 miles of range, does appear with some frequency on used car searches under $20,000. With about 150 horsepower, 110 kilowatts, and 236 foot pounds or 320 newton meters of torque, it's not a rocket ship, but you don't have to worry about getting up to speed on the highway either. The LEAF is versatile and comfortable, if not spirited. But, and this is a big but, without a thermally managed battery pack, and with the model's poor history, I just don't have much faith in the battery longevity, and Nissan's handling of the premature battery degradation issues experienced by LEAF owners has been terrible. It's also a Chatamo car, and in a charging ecosystem where Chatamo is becoming vanishingly rare, that's a problem for me. And then there's the issue of Nissan trying to prevent the same battery degradation issues that the first generation LEAF had, by restricting DC charging speeds if you try to rapid charge more than once in a day. Again, Nikki's made some videos on that that you can see here. We've got our Tesla for long trips, but the option to fast charge is something I want to have at this price point. Speaking of price point, the Nissan Leaf Plus with its 50% larger battery and higher horsepower figures hasn't come up in my searches for under 20,000 yet. On the other hand, First generation Nissan Leafs can be bought for four figures all day long, with some going for under $5,000. But at their best, those cars only have 70 miles of range, and I'm gonna guess if you're buying one for four or $5,000, it's not at its best anymore. Those cars very much have a place, and for some people's use cases, they're a great fit, but not for mine. As we covered here, you can put a new, larger battery in these, but then the price can end up being more than cars with active battery cooling, and you're still relying on the Nissan battery chemistry making up for that lack of thermal management. In a somewhat similar vein to the LEAF, there's the last of the Volkswagen e-Golfs, which in its later iterations had 125 miles of maximum range, though the earlier models had significantly less at 83. The e-Golf has a reputation as being a great driving car, with a comfortable cabin and good cargo versatility which is far from given with compliance cars, which is what we'd consider it in the USA, if not necessarily in Europe. But prices on used e-Golfs are comically high for a car without a thermally managed battery and relatively short legs, often exceeding our $20,000 price cap. Speaking of compliance cars, if we're talking about sub-$20,000 EVs, there are a bunch of compliance cars that come up. 
These are factory electric conversions of internal combustion vehicles, usually produced in limited numbers and sold in limited markets, with subpar performance intended to keep their manufacturers in compliance with California emission goals, rather than intend to be good mass market vehicles. It's important to note that not every electric vehicle built on a platform used for internal combustion variants is necessarily a compliance car in the traditional sense. The Hyundai Kona EV and Kia e Niro, for instance, are cross-platform with petrol and hybrid versions. They also haven't always been available in all markets, a common compliance car trait. But on the other hand, they are fully realized cars with competitive range, great handling acceleration, and they're intended to make money, while historically many compliance cars were sold at a loss. But the early days of modern EVs are chock full of some highly compromised vehicles. You'll find cars like the Ford Focus Electric, which is basically a regular Ford Focus with a trunk full of batteries. The Fiat 500e, which has a paltry range and so much torque that it's hard not to spin its wheels if a gnat has peed on the pavement under its tyres. The Mitsubishi Aimeev, which was one of the very first modern day EVs to be mass produced, but has a tiny range and a cabin that can charitably be called economical. Though I gather it's still better than its internal combustion sibling. Or the diminutive Smart for 2 Electric, whose small stature is well matched by its tiny range. The good thing about those cars is they can often be had very cheaply, and while they don't personally suit my needs, there are many people for whom they're worth a look. If you're only driving 20 or 30 miles in a day, for instance, they're great. Even more so if your driving needs are both short-range and infrequent, as EVs don't suffer for sitting the way that a piston car can. The stereotypical grandmother who takes her car to church on Sunday and the hairdresser every couple of weeks, and thus puts a minuscule amount of miles on a given year, would do great with these sorts of cars. Likewise, one of my closest friends commutes about six miles round trip every day, but in Vermont winter doesn't want to walk or bike. His aging Toyota's petrol engine doesn't even come up to operating temperature half the time, and that's going to mean worse emissions and wear and tear. A compliance EV might work well for most of his needs. Additionally, I think some folk who are interested in plug-in hybrids might do well with a short load compliance car for 90% of their driving, and renting a petrol car for long hauls where they'd use a PHEV's piston engine. Another compliance vehicle that should get a mention is the second generation Toyota RAV4 Electric. The drivetrain components were by Tesla, and by all accounts it was a great little electric SUV, and a worthy successor to the first generation version. Unfortunately, neither Toyota nor Tesla provide ongoing product support for them, so if and when something goes wrong, getting repairs made can be incredibly expensive and time consuming if those repairs are even possible. It's a problem, and one that's going to be more and more of an issue for compliance cars as time goes on. Going from the early days of modern EVs to 2021, we find the one new car that almost sort of comes in at a price point worth mentioning with our budget, the cross-platform Mini Electric. The base price on this little car is just under $30,000, but with state and local incentives, if your tax liability is such that the federal tax incentive applies, it will just about come in close enough to 20 grand to be worth mentioning. The Mini Electric is built on the same production line as the piston-powered Mini, much like the Kona EV and Kia e Niro are built alongside their petrol siblings. BMW, which owns Mini, has a variety of electric offerings, and doesn't need a compliance car to meet regulations, so we wouldn't really consider this to be a compliance car. But while it's the cheapest electric car you can buy brand new in the USA, the range reflects the price point. I love modern Minis, though I've never gotten to drive a vintage one for all that I'm eager to, and from everything I've heard, the new Mini Electric is a fantastic driver's car. But with 114 miles of range, it just doesn't meet what I'm looking for at that kind of price. Plus, Mini as a brand hasn't had the best reliability history, and with a drivetrain out of my beloved i3, my husband's injunction against another i3 apparently applies to the Mini as well. So, that brings us to the most economical and environmentally friendly option that we looked at taking the Chevy buyback and going down to being a one-car family. We're moving out west to the greater Portland, Oregon area. There are far more public transportation options than way out here in rural Maine, and with a milder winter, electric bicycles and electric motorcycle, and working from home all the time, going down just my husband's Tesla is worth considering. But right in the middle of a cross-continent move isn't the right time to make that decision. GM offered us $18,200 for my 2017 Bolt Premier. It's a fair offer, if not a generous one, given what we paid for the car used and the miles we have on the clock. But with the cost of used cars going up, it isn't enough to buy a Bolt built after the battery pack manufacturing defects were addressed. 
And as I've just spent several minutes detailing, there wasn't anything else that stood out as a good option without laying out more money. I think there's a good chance we'll go down to one car, but moving to a new area without that option just doesn't feel smart to us. We'll get to know the Portland area and then decide. We might not get as much selling our car as we could have from the buyback, but if we were to get rid of the car now and then decide it was a mistake, replacing it would be a costly endeavor in today's market. Then again, as we detailed here, prices for used EVs, especially cars like the Bolt EV, are far higher on the west coast of the US than they are where I currently live. Honestly, it's a decision I'm pretty comfortable with. I remain unconvinced that the final recall software update, which my car just received, will adequately solve the battery fire problem. And we likely won't be parking in the garage under our new apartment, at least at first, when we move out to Oregon. But I love my Bolt in almost every respect. It's versatile, fun to drive, it's got great range, and the thermally managed battery isn't very prone to degrading. Its DC fast charging speed may be frankly dismal compared to our Tesla Model 3 and many other new EVs, but compared to what one can buy for under 20,000 US dollars, its CCS DC fast charging is frankly awesome. Note, though common, fast charging was optional on the Bolt, so make sure any car you're looking at has it if it's important to you. So there you have it. We went through the process of getting a buyback offer, but in the end, for us as folks who bought our Bolt used for an aggressive price in the first place, it simply didn't make sense to get out of the Bolt right now. We're going to take our chances on the software update and hope that General Motors knows something Hyundai didn't when it went through this with the Kona EV. I'll let you know how it all goes. That's it for today. Please do hit subscribe and the bell if you haven't as it stops YouTube from doing weird things with our content. And make sure you're subscribed to Take Two and Transport Evolve Shorts. There are links below. Thanks on behalf of the entire Transport Evolve crew. Go out to the folks on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month Patreon supporters. Special thanks to our $50 a month patrons, Andrew Martin, Guido Drahada, Ruffy Wolf, Anonymous Freak, Regine Fellows, Kyle Hodson, Gordon C, Paul Conway, Laura Sanborn, Anthony Coates, Denny Hyde, Sean Ueda, and Tesla and the Gong. And our deepest gratitude to our $100 month Patreon supporters, John Lyons, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, JP Fagerback, Will Graylin, and Ian. If you'd like to join the ranks of our wonderful supporters, you'll find links below to Patreon, Bitcoin, and Ko-fi. You can always chat with the team and Transport Evolve fans over on our Discord, and if you'd like to buy some Transport Evolve swag, just head over to Redbubble store. Our new Pride designs are now in stock, and all proceeds from this month go to the Trevor Project. Thanks for joining me, and as always, keep evolving!